Hello and welcome to the 1916 Company Podcast. I'm Tim Masso here with Armand Johnston. Today we are discussing the best of the 2024 edition of Watches and Wonders. I want to remind everyone that you can suggest topics and forward questions to us. Podcasts at the 1916company.com. That's podcasts, plural, at the 1916company.com. Armand, lead off. Where do we stand? Watches and Wonders 2024. What caught your eye? Watches and Wonders 2024. Well, first and foremost, um, I feel like this was a bit of a maintenance release for a lot of brands, which I am not, I, I don't hate. I, I like. I like releases that are a little bit that have a little bit less luster than the year before than the previous years. It it uh, kind of bookmarks a time in the industry and it kind of bookmarks a, a breathing point almost for certain brands. And I think that's what this was for a, a lot of brands. But uh, honestly, uh, best in show to me was probably Cartier. I loved the the new releases. The Santos Dumont Reverse is an absolute instant favorite for me. And what did you think of the revival of the old CPCP Tortu Mono Pusher? So mixed feelings. I loved, love, I love the Mono Pusher. I love the Tortu case. I was a little bit now. Correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I did read that it was a Salida based movement, which I was a little bit confused by, actually. Well, I mean, here, here's the thing. There's a lot of Salida out there these days, but it's not always the ETA clones that we think it is. But I think that the most important thing is just that they didn't really continue with the THA movement that made the watch what it was in the 90s. Like it was that incredible column wheel oscillating pinion mono pusher by Jorn and uh, by Denny Flageolet that really made that watch so cool, especially in retrospect, as more people you know came to grasp what that meant. Alter as well, right? Uh, yeah, he was part of THA. I mm -hmm. think the principal fathers of that specific model were... Jorn and Flageolet, because Flageolet later repurposed the movement, and he brought it back to use in the uh, DB1 family of chronographs. He actually repurchased the right to use the movement. Uh, so, you know, interesting stuff. I, I think it's good to bring back the CPCP because people did love those watches, and I think that the Cartier fine watchmaking of 2008 to 2015 oftentimes focused on watches that were huge. There were a lot of Rotan de Cartier models that were just the size of a fist, and they were incredibly complicated and accomplished, but they weren't watches I'd want to wear. The Rotan Jumping Hour is one of the ones uh, from that series that's just fantastic. Yeah, I think what's really cool this year is that Cartier focused mostly on style, which is actually not a bad thing for Cartier. I think it was a big mistake to want them to be this Giger Le Coultre-like manufacturer, which was going to be dominant in movements and original mechanisms on every level. At its peak, Cartier was never a movement maker. It was a style house. And I feel like getting back to that, if they can really ace the design, is the best way they could be in watchmaking. When I think of Cartier, I don't, I don't think of movements necessarily. Now, I did have the quip about the Salida movement, granted, but that's only because of where the movement came from. When I think of Cartier, it is a design house, and it is a, a, a mega design house. Yeah, almost like a more pedigreed version of Bell & Ross. Like with Bell & Ross, the Parisian-based, they make in Switzerland, but the Parisian-based, and that's always been the heart and soul of the brand, they're a style house. Some brands do that incredibly well. Remember, for its first almost 250 years, Vacheron was not a manufacturer. Was it Holy Trinity? Yes. Was it one of the finest in the business? Yes. It matters who you work with. And in Cartier's case, traditionally, they never made movements, but they made wonderful watches. You pick the right partners, and I think the Tour 2 has that style. I just think that the worst thing about the new Tour 2 Mono Pusher is the old Tour 2 Mono Pusher, which is still <laughs> well available. Put. Very well put. Uh, but to your point about this being a maintenance year, I really found that with Patek Philippe, this was a very conservative new model year. If you look at what they did, it was mostly a combination of new dials and new metals for existing models. And I'm actually okay with that uh, for two reasons. First, I thought that they have one of the strongest lineups from top to bottom with Patek. And I really do think that unlike, say, you know, Audemars Piguet, which is dominated by the Royal Oak and Vacheron, which is really struggling to find its center of gravity as a brand, Patek has Calatrava, Aquanaut, Nautilus. They've got complications and grand complications. The only real weakness was Ellipse, but they had a pretty good year on that front. And speaking of that, the 5738 1R is um, right up there with uh, with the Santos and Best on, in show for me. That uh, 
that bracelet is very evocative of oh gosh what the late 70s early 80s and yeah it manages to be its own thing too though at first i thought oh beads of rice and i'm like wait no it's not it's quite that it's not quite that it's it's a woven inter integrated pattern and uh, i wouldn't want to have to do it yeah rows of chevrons that's the best way to describe this bracelet it's a fine mesh it's integrated to the case this is a lugless watch and a beautiful one i rows of chevrons is fantastic and it, it, it there is there's actually something you just struck a chord with me because it, the design was very Patek Philippe when I initially looked at it. When I when it was initially presented, I, I thought that is that is a Patek Philippe design and uh, rows of chevrons. I like that a lot. And you know, let me double check this, but I believe, yeah, you know, it's a very beautiful watch. And people forget why it's called golden ellipse. It's not because it's always made of gold, although that is often the case. It's the golden ratio of its 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 aspect ratio, its height to width. And it is a beautifully shapely thing. It's only six millimeters thick. And the dial is always made of solid gold. So there's a lot of nuance here. Also, people don't often mistake it for some sort of a manual wind watch. It's actually micro a micro rotor. rotor automatic. So when you take the golden ratio section, the integrated bracelet with its chevrons, you take the solid gold dial, this micro rotor movement, this is a really elite piece and one that is deeply enjoyable, but you got to be at peace with simplicity because it's a two hand watch. And I think that's where this is going to fall down in some people's view. It doesn't have uh, the liveliness they expect with running seconds. You know, I think, I think you're right about that. The running seconds is something that I often um, will discuss on time only time pieces. And this is a true time only dress very, very particular, yeah. simple timepiece. And, you know, I, I wanted to point out the pricing, um, which I didn't think was uh, outrageous, actually. It's 60000 and change for retail, which for a time-only micro-rotor, one may question, but the bracelet is, is the, handmade. The way it's made is what makes this watch worth the money. The, the way it is made, I don't know if Patek gets as much credit as it should for the bracelets it makes, because people get hung up on the pin sleeve removable links. But if you can get over the pin sleeves, and they have a good reason, they don't want screws stripped out and links stranded. But if you can get over the pin sleeve system, these are beautifully made bracelets. And really, the fact that they're doing it in-house as opposed to sort of consigning this to some sort of specialist supplier really speaks to the might of Patek watchmaking that they could do this in-house, because this is no mean bracelet. This is a very intricate piece. Seeing their gem setting in person um, was one of the uh, one of the awe inspiring moments for me when I was at the factory. You know, uh, I've I was in the industry, uh, you know, interested in jewelry before going to the Patek factory, but seeing their gem setting, their engraving, uh, honestly, their dial manufacture, the the sum of the whole, really, honestly, it made all of the pricing make so much more sense to me. And I'll also add this the best revision for me from Podtech this year was a watch I already liked, but which was hard to read. Uh, three years ago, the 5236P came out, and I adored the inline perpetual calendar. The problem was polished hands and polished indices on a fairly dark blue dial could be a bit difficult to pick up. So while I don't necessarily love the new salmon dial tonally, I do love the contrast, and I think ultimately this will become my favorite version of the watch, simply because it is so plain to read. When you've got blackened white gold hands and indices on a salmon blasted dial base, this dial is is beyond beautiful. This opaline rose gilt that they've got, I think really resolves all of the objections I had to the original 5235 regulator. Uh, of course, the 5236 is the big brother of the regulator. Center hands made it easier to read, and now blackened hands and indices on a salmon dial make it easier still. $141,000, I should say. We're not talking a cheap watch, but this is a worthwhile revision that makes a functional difference. It's not just aesthetics, and I don't know if that's what they had in mind here because salmon dials are always popular but in terms of practicality this became a better timekeeper on a variation front i thought the new nautilus denim was really cool i thought that was that was you just know i've awesome. been calling it the jay leno uh and i have i have i, I like the dial combo with the metal i i want to see the strap in person you know i'm a little confused that they use the same type of strap on the world timer as well in the 5330g but i think they were it seems that they're reaching for more of a casual nature with that yeah the fact that this is white gold look they don't want to make a whole lot of steel nautiluses for obvious reasons they want to let that scene cool off a bit but the fact is the kind of guy who would buy steel would buy white gold and 
putting it on a strap does keep the price point almost in like a steel watch kind of market segment. So all things considered, for under 80 grand, you're getting a watch that will never be worth less than you pay for it. That looks cool, casual. You should have absolutely no trouble with denim. Wear it with whatever you want. People wear jeans with suits today. <laughs> so I, I don't see this watch having any real limitations. Between the flyback chrono, the water resistance, the loom, the denim strap, this is, this is the definition of smart casual. A good piece, but again, an evolution, not a revolution. All right. So, did you, are we pretty much done with Pod Tech, or did something you know, really pop? One for you? one thing that did really pop for me I actually wasn't on my initial list, but I I have questions and I'm very excited about it. The fifty three ninety six G O one seven dial diamond dial. I think this is a absolute knockout. I really love fifty three ninety six as a complications in general. My confusion comes from the fact that it's not platinum. I wanted this to be the last version of the watch. I wanted this to be platinum and I wanted nothing else different. I still suspect this is the last version. I think it's going out on the same high as the 5170P. I think the reason they copped the fade dial with the diamond indices is because this will be the last version. And I think maybe the reason they're not going with platinum is because technically this is what they would call a complication, not a grand complication. I believe that in the annals of, of Patek hierarchy, I, I think all of the premier watches, things like lateral clutch chronographs, perpetual calendars, watches with overcoil hairsprings rather than silicon springs, these will earn the platinum send-off, and I think something that is merely complicated will earn a white gold send-off. And I think in this case, because it's a wheel-based annual calendar system, they're given it the same look as the 5170P, but not the platinum case. Very fair uh, distinction uh, with the, the comps and grand comps. And, you know, uh, to speak to the dial a little bit further, the the gradient is really what kind of threw me because, of course, the 5396R had a diamond dial um, already, which is beautiful as well. Uh, but yeah, really good points with the grand comp two complication in the materials. I, I'm... I'm bookmarking that mentally. <laughs> so, so now we will await possibly next year the replacement for the 5396. We don't know that it's coming next year. We don't even know that the line will be discontinued next year. But I think this is the beginning of the end. So if you're interested, register your interest early and often with your Patek dealer. Okay, so now something from an entirely different universe, Ulysse Norden. If you are out in cyberspace, definitely check out my interview with general manager or managing director, I should say, Matthew Haverlon, who is very open and honest about what it means to rebuild the UN brand. But he was clear that the icon will be the freak and that the freak will be the flagship of the company, that they're going to do less than 10,000 watches a year, but about 1,000 of those will be freaks. Well, of the freaks, the freak S is going to be the flagship. This came out two years Years ago, and when I first saw it during Watches and Wonders, I said, "Best in show, possibly Egido at the GPHG." I really thought that this was going to be the watch of the year. Now, I did think it had a bit of a shortcoming in that rose gold is a powerful look, and while I love the rose gold in Aventurine, it's just too much. You know, for the same reason you wouldn't want to drive a Lamborghini Revuelto in places where, you know, you want to keep a low profile, you wouldn't necessarily want to wear a giant rose gold complication everywhere. And I don't mean because you're going to get robbed or, or you're going to get targeted. Just, it's it's like rolling around with a bordello on your wrist. It's too much. It's, it's over the top. It's walking everywhere with two middle fingers pointing forward. Exactly. It's like, you're basically just saying like, I am the bomb. I'm too cool for school kiss my, you know, kiss my ring peasant, like that sort of thing. So what they did was they made a new version of it called the Nomad, the Freak S Nomad, that is now in titanium with a spectacular champagne guilloche dial rather than the Aventurine. And while I do sort of mourn the loss of the Aventurine, the engine turning on this dial, they call it a dune-colored dial, and it really does have that look. So if you want to know what Paul Atreides would wear, it would be this. And furthermore, it's got everything I loved about the original Freak S, including two free-sprung independent escapements and oscillators geared to a differential, 
sitting on a carousel tourbillon. So like the Philippe Dufour duality or the double balancier from Grubel Forcey, you have two different oscillators geared together by a differential, angled at different angles relative to each other and beating in opposition. And so error in one is pretty much counteracted directly and proportionally by error in the other. So if one runs fast, the other runs slow, they even out with the differential. This is not just compelling thing to look at, though it is that. It is also an excellent timekeeper, which is a standard we rarely ascribed to freaks just because, well, the lack of a second's hand and, you know, the fact that it works at all was kind of a miracle. This is a watch that is equally dedicated to style and chronometry. It uses things that only UN can do. For example, they have their own silicon provider, Sigatech. It They've owned it since 2006, so they can make the silicon escape wheel lever and balance that goes on this watch and so they're making all of the tough parts not just the easy ones the dial is fully loomed so it's practical the case is titanium which is everyday wearable and it has their grinder automatic winding system which is sort of like a hybrid of a rotor and a peripheral with a three-day power reserve it's still a no crown freak set using the bezel and wound using the case back so there's no compromise here it's not one of those freak x's where you have mixed feelings about its freak purity this is a really cool watch this is this is probably my favorite of the year the engine turning is outrageous i think the tone of the material that they use is perfect and i, I like uh, i like a um kind of a, a warm champagne style dial like this it's interesting it's also something that's i f- i feel like it's not very common on pieces like this on watches that are this type of wearable yeah it's an unusual thing to see traditional rose lathe guilloche on something that's not classically inspired like this is the kind of thing you expect to see on breguet or certain types of patek philippe maybe on a chrono swiss in stamped form but to have traditional rose lathe guilloche alongside the space age aesthetic of the freak it's a really competitive like really competitive juxtaposition that makes this like an alternative to the world of Honestly, Erwerk, Grubel Forcey, Richard Mille, MBNF, like that that kind of watch. Also competitive with Debatune, to be perfectly frank. It fits in very well in a collection with the rest of those as well. And I think I think that's something that um, makes UN very much worth looking at um, because it, it can stand up to the likes of those brands. It can sit, sit side by side in those collections. And I believe this is going to be somewhere around $148,000. So we're talking real money. But if you actually check that interview I conducted with Matthew Haverlon, because the amount of money they're spending to prop up Ulysse Norden resale values, including buying and destroying unsold inventory, no company, I think, in the space right now is being more proactive about controlling its aftermarket and protecting its buyers. And obviously, there are companies that have a huge head start and reputation. Patek Philippe, Audemars Piguet, various independents like F.P. Journe, their markets are already as stout as can be. But that is a function mostly of social media attention, whereas UN is not yet getting that attention, but they're putting in the work. So I would say buy with confidence, but also look at it as a long-term hold because I can see things getting worse before they get better. Um, Debatoon, what did you think this year? Oh my gosh, Grand Comp, Grand Comp, Grand Comp. I was blown away by Denny's Grand Comp. 751 components, gorgeous, kind of too styling, very Debatoon, very interesting. And you know, I, I hate to even point this detail out because it's so small and it's so seemingly inconsequential, but matching apertures matching date apertures to the dial that is yeah, where the disc deal. actually is the color of the dial yes and the 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 font is done in gilt it is such a big deal and it's it's gorgeous it's it's drop dead on the on the grand comp i uh, few words uh, can be said about that watch it's so outrageous Okay, so a few words about Debatoon. Of course, you guys out in cyberspace know that we own the company through the greater 1916 family. But at the same time, take a look at the watch and disagree with me, if you will. But when you have something that is a four-day power reserve with a rotating case, a dial on each side, a deadbeat second with 14-karat gold escape wheels, a 30-second tourbillon, a power reserve indicator, a perpetual calendar, and a moon phase with retrograding age of the moon. If that doesn't get you excited, 
I don't know what does. It's kind of hard for me to hype something like that because it's self-evident that that's a monster watch. So like or dislike, but I'm giving you full disclosure. Take a look at the watch and judge it on its own merits. The first two years are sold out, so frankly, I don't care what you think. <laughs> and it's going to be five pieces a year. So a monstrous watch that harks back to the DB16. But the difference here is that unlike the DB16, this has a rotating case with a dial on each side. Now, this is also the world's lightest tourbillon at 0.8 grams, correct? That, that's true, but that, that's true across every Dibitoon tourbillon. They use a common architecture. Silicon, white, gold, and titanium, the tourbillon is 18 hundredths of a gram. And there's a chronometry purpose. Like, Debitune tourbillons run plus one-third to plus one second per day. This is not just like something along the lines of, you know, the Fugaku tourbillon from Grand Seiko, where it was a very ornate watch, but not a great timekeeper. This is both very ornate and a very good timekeeper. There's so much Debatoon DNA in this piece as well, from the heat blued titanium dial to the uh, palladium and steel moon phase. It's it's very, very Debatoon. And from what I understand, this is uh, the project of the better part of 10 years. It is. And, you know, for $475,000, you deserve all of this if you're buying one. But in terms of things that are inextricably linked to the brand, you've got the fired blue titanium on the primary dial, the black polished bridges on the secondary dial, the 30-second tourbillon, the floating lugs that are variable geometry to fit your wrist, and the fact that they're making the case, the dials, the movement, even things like the balance wheel are being done in-house. So at the very least, you know, you're not buying Denny Flageolet sports cars and mansions and the money is going into the product when you buy one of these. So that and the Purple Rain, very cool. Purple Rain, part of the DB28XS collection, so thinner, smaller, 38.7 millimeters, a real nice watch. I would describe it as unisex, and I think that's the idea there. Uh, the DB28s always wore a little bit large because of the lug span. So the Grand Comp is going to be 43, but it wears more like a 45, whereas the 28 XS Purple Rain, that's really going to wear like a 40 on the wrist. Fun piece, random guilloche dial, six-day power reserve, fired purple titanium. So guys, if you wonder what fired purple titanium looks like, definitely check that out. You can see it over at the Debitune website. It's definitely more on the... Um more on the outlandish side, but I purple is one of my favorite colors, and it is such a r solid tone of purple. And correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, purple comes before blue in the heat scale. That's right. You first get yellow, then you get sort of a, I would Green. say, a, I would say, yeah, a more more like, like a brownish violet. And in, normally green is like an anodized color. Okay. And uh, then you get sort of like a brownish violet, and it gradually turns purpler as you go between that sort of brownish tone and... And blue. If you fire something for a really long time and just keep the heat applied, it'll turn blue. Uh, the, the tough thing is to arrest the process in a way such that you get that wonderful purple, but that all the purple parts match. Anyone who's built like a custom bicycle knows that if you're coloring parts, it can be very difficult to get them to match. So all these things, the two sets of lugs, the dial and the case and the case back, they all have to have the same purple. So the quality control process is a bit of a challenge there. You know, I was just looking at a uh, DB28 that we had the lugs switched out on from uh, long to short, and uh, they were both zirconium lugs, and the tone of the zirconium was slightly different between the two of them, which I found really interesting. Um, but I got to handle the articulating lugs themselves, separate from the watch, which was really cool. You know, it's not something that you see very often, and uh, I don't know, not something that I really thought about before getting the handle, but it was really interesting. Yeah, so, so that's sort of where De Debitune is. Now, they weren't formally part of Watches and Wonders. We're just including them because their releases overlapped with Watches and Wonders. Just keep that in mind. Now, in terms of shoot the moon type stuff, uh, I'm going to go with the Piaget Alt Plano Ultimate Concept Tourbillon. But before I do, I want to remind people that there are still affordable watches out there. And I thought one of the best was from Balmain Mercier, and this was the... Tidograph, so the Riviera Tidograph. So everyone knows that there's some watches, most famously the Quorum Admiral's Cup, that include the tides complication. So you can see the ebb and flow of tides, and this is usually related but not identical to the moon phase complication. So the Riviera is the sports watch collection of Balmain Mercier, and it's a great piece. 
affordable, powered by the same movement you'll get in a $14,000 IWC Ingenieur. You've got automatic winding. You've got a five-day power reserve. You've got an eight-year warranty. This uh, new Riviera 10, it's the 10761 reference, but it's called the Tidograph. Uh, 500 pieces. It's going to be made of, I believe, stainless steel in this case. And the watch is an absolutely beautiful sort of octagonal form that dates back to the early 1970s. So unlike, I would say, 99% of the competitors in this space, it's not derivative of some sort of Royal Oak or Nautilus. So it's very much their own design. The blue dial, the steel case, the water resistance means you can absolutely take it swimming. There's no problem on that front. I believe it's 100 meters. And then you've got this really cool tides complication. In good taste, they went with a no-date dial, so it's dominated by the tides display. And at 43 millimeters, it's large, but it's also relatively easy 43 to wear. It's more like a tonneau case than a round one. There's a lot I love with this watch, and the fact that you are getting that five-day Valfleurier movement is really, really cool. I would also say that the value at $5,350 is super solid. Also, I believe bracelets are available if you wanted to upgrade and there is a relative, I think there's a quick uh, switch mechanism built in here where you can just pop the strap off and change the look so you don't even need tools. And I believe the Balmatic Caliber even has a high degree of anti-magnetic qualities. So I always like to shout out things that give you value. And with complications, a sub $5,400 price point and eight years of warranty, this 43 millimeter steel Riviera Tidograph is really good value. 5350 for a... Watch with a complication that nobody makes, effectively. The title complication is really conserved now to G-Shocks. Yeah, I, I would say most of the title complications are little computers. They're yeah. electronic quartz watches that have a title function built in. And that's cool and all, but it's it's tougher to do things with gears and springs and levers. And so for me, it's more emotional, I think, that this is all mechanically driven and if you think about it, you could buy this watch, wear it for five years, and still have three years of warranty on it when the time comes to sell. It also gives you a good hint as to how broad the service intervals are, because they wouldn't give you a warranty that is larger than the service interval. So this is, this is a good value right here. Now, in terms of just spending all the money in one place, then you've got the Piaget Altiplano Ultimate Concept Tourbillon, which I believe is going to retail for over 720,000 Swiss francs. But hold, hold on here. This is a very cool watch. So this is 150 years of Piaget. The watch, like the original Altiplano Ultimate Concept, uh, this Altiplano Ultimate Concept Tourbillon is two millimeters thick, and it literally builds the movement into the case. So there is no distinction between the base plate and the case back. They are one. Two millimeters thick, and it's got an unusual crown that uses a worm gear for setting and winding. It's actually going to do away with conventional keyless works. There is a tourbillon that is as flat as the watch and a crystal that is mere fractions of a millimeter thick and held on by adhesive. Now, the watch has a real-world 40-hour power reserve in spite of being super thin. 40 hours, despite having the tourbillon regulator, which is always very energy intensive. And I believe that the tourbillon operates on ball bearings, which is a very cool kind of uh, way to do this. Uh, makes the watch thinner, also decreases friction. And the whole thing is simply mind boggling. When you've worn one of these, it's otherworldly. And it's even 20 meters water resistant, which is incredibly bizarre given how thin it is and the fact that the crystal is held on by adhesive. Uh, but just a watch that's really cool, blue PVD, cobalt metal case how many other cobalt alloy cases do you find and it's highly customizable they will do bespoke here so you're not totally locked into whatever the stock setup is for your 720 thousand swiss francs i think this is a great shoot the moon watch it's sort of a realization of what watchmaking can be at its most exotic even if it's profoundly impractical i i think it's a beautiful dream do you think that the case material choice had anything to do with the thickness? Because they've made the watches maybe not quite as thin in other materials, but cobalt is a really interesting choice, is it? It's super hard. Yeah, that what, was my thought. Yeah, there's two reasons they did that. One, if you're going to build the movement into the case back, you need a reasonable amount of certainty that the jewels won't pop out. So you need rigidity. And it's very difficult to do that with super thin steel or titanium. Let alone gold. Yeah, or any kind of precious metal, exactly. So going with the cobalt is all about 
One, keeping the jewels from popping out of their seats, and two, preventing the crystal from popping out of the bezel. So that's kind of what's going on there. I think it's very cool. Very like cool indeed. the original Ultiplano Ultimate concept, it will be monstrously expensive, but I'm happy to live in a world where it exists. So what, what do you have up next? Uh, let's see. So my next was the Zenith Defy Diver, uh, the 37 millimeter reissue of, um, gosh, the Defy A3648. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. It is perfect. You know, uh, a watch like this is very cool to me because it is a very true vintage revival. It is, gosh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's effectively the same movement with slight modern upgrades here and there. And it's just, it it's funky. You know, the case design makes the measurement go right out the window. You know, this watch is going to wear like a 40 millimeter watch, despite being a 37, due to the angular case design, due to that very 70s just overall helmet dome bell feel it's a really good addition i think there are two interesting there's an interesting dichotomy in the divers that came out you've got the defi extreme diver which is 42.5 titanium helium escape valve much more modern looking watch and then you've got the heritage defi which was a 1969 watch zenith's first diver the 3648 it was late to the party in terms of dive watches. Most companies that got into the dive space did it a decade prior to that at least. But being 600 meters in its day was a real feather in its cap and an advancement beyond, I would say, three times. That was that was three times what was considered to be a professional dive watch at the time. And they managed to recreate all of the endearing qualities of the original without the fragilities. And the nice thing about these re-editions from Zenith is that they give you the opportunity to wear a very true to history re-edition that captures everything great about the original right down to the size, but without the fragility and the fraught aftermarket where you run into watches in bad condition, Franken watches, unscrupulous sellers, eBay fly-by-night operations. So the fact that these Zenith re-editions are almost literally the same watch makes them incredibly appealing. Now, there are some upgrades. The crystal, though bubble and plexiglass-like, is a sapphire here. The bracelet's going to be similar in appearance, but a little bit more, I would say, robust. Sturdy. Yeah. And then the movement on the original would have been a 2552 PC. And on the new one, it's a caliber 670 Elite, which is great because you get a very serviceable, high-quality modern movement. 50 hours, bi-directional quick set, hacking seconds, and it is up there with, you know, your GP3300, your JLC, you know, 899. This is a high-quality, thin tractor movement that's used throughout the industry and very well-regarded. It's, it's Zenith's non-chrono, but it is definitely worth its salt. Launched in 1994. It's also one of Zenith's newer movements. So this is a really cool piece. If you want bigger, if you want bolder, there's the DeFi Extreme. But I don't think anyone needs much more than the A3648 re-edition. And it would be really nice to start putting together a collection of these modern re-edition Zeniths. That could be both very fashionable and very fun. And again, something like this, you know, try it on. Don't pay attention to the size or the the, the, the measurement suggestion. Um, beyond that, I just want to touch on price point of this because I know mm-hmm. we'll talk about this on the other end of it. This is $7,700. That is refreshing. That is a refreshing retail price for a watch like this. Yeah, it's an honest reflection of what the watch costs to make. And we don't see a whole lot of that. Honestly, from other brands, this would be a $10,000 product. And I don't think they would bat an eye asking that. Zenith's been very fair about its pricing. If you take a look this year, they also came out with a DeFi Skyline Tourbillon, which are in the, I want to say like forty dollars to $50,000 range or fifty to 60000 I think it's in the 60s for the ceramic version. But Zenith's pretty honest about the price of its watches. And it also does us all a favor by not forcing us to buy the best stuff in precious metal first. I'm not going to name names, but there are a lot of brands in the business that will do that first they'll offer yellow gold exhaust the interest in that then they'll offer rose gold exhaust the interest in that then they'll go through white gold and platinum and when all that's done they'll issue steel which makes you either pay up front for something you don't really want or wait forever for the one you do and i'm happy that zenith just goes straight for the meat of the market offering a steel or titanium watch at a very fair price honestly i would say their prices are as fair as the likes of oris and balme mercier and tudor which are always going to keep it real price-wise. One thing I don't necessarily think is priced well, but I like is the new 
Pioneer Center Seconds Concept Citrus Green. Now, this is from Moser. Moser's famous for its funky dials. It does a lot of dial fades, does a lot of dial colors, and it iterates a lot on existing platforms, which means for any given model, you're going to find a ton of different dials. That can grow a little bit tiresome, but I'd say every once in a while, they do come out with a dial that really pops as genuinely different. And so they have this new Pioneer Center Seconds Concept Citrus Dial. This is the first time the Concept Dial, which has no dates, no indices, no calibration, nothing but hands. This is the first time that concept dial has been transposed onto a Pioneer. And the citrus green is really cool. A fade from almost, I would say, electric yellow at the center to electric green at the edge. So running the whole spectrum from lemon to lime. And here's where I don't like this. The price is about 14,800 US dollars. This is a steel three-hand automatic watch, and it is probably the case they produce most, amortizing the tooling with the movement, the HMC 200 base, that they use all across their line and have used for years. And I really do think that this should be priced about two to $3,000 less. I feel like this should be, you know, like an $11,000 watch. I think they, they made a great watch, and then they asked too much money for it. But I'm also going to say that if it's a short run, they could still redeem it. If this is something that's made ultra exclusive, I do think that they could justify the price on the basis of rarity, but they've got to be clear about that. Now, they did make some changes to the movement. The HMC 200 uh, is something that they've iterated many times, but this is the HMC 201, which means it has anthracite bridges and plates and partial skeletonization which means you can see things you normally can't like the pole based winding system and the drivetrain so i like this i think they've really gone all out with the blue strap the lemon lime dial the concept architecture of the dial uh, the new movement with its nickel anthracite and skeletonization but i do think this needs to be scarce if they're going to justify the price they need people to understand that this isn't going to be the first of many it's going to be the first of very few all right, so this is something that was not Watches and Wonders, but was almost concurrent with the new model season that revolved around the show. The new Blancpain 50 Fathoms. I think the new 5010, 42 millimeters, they nailed it. The price, given the quality of the case, the dial, and the movement, is acceptable. And I think that the size is perfect. The best thing I can say about this watch is that proportionally, it looks exactly like the old 5015. You would not know it's a smaller watch until you hold it in your hand. What is the price point in steel? The price point in steel varies. 18400 for titanium. It's not available in steel yet. And then there is 19300 to get it with the bracelet in titanium. So for me, this is the kind of diver that is intended for a strap. So I don't see any problem with 18400 for a handmade, hand-finished diver that will be made in lower volumes than any sea dweller, submariner, or sea master that has a five-day power reserve a hand-regulated six-position movement, hand-finished bridges, plates, wheels, all the important things in high horology are present here alongside all of the important things that you would want in a diver, which really makes this the Cadillac of dive watches. And considering its price advantage relative to something like a Royal Oak Offshore Diver, I don't see any issues here. And I'm, I'm very impressed by the fact that this doesn't cost, you know, $15,000 to start and twenty grand with a bracelet. I also think over time, you know, depreciation will be your friend, but I also don't think you're going to get bitten quite as bad buying a blanc pad, you know, dive watch compared to like one of their dress watch complications. Agreed. The sports models always do significantly better in blanc pan. And I would also say this, they're probably going to have a wait list for a solid year or so. So if you want to buy it and wear it a little bit, see if you like it. I think the, the retail is going to hold up for at least a year and you'll be able to get out of that if you want to. And I think long-term... This is the kind of watch you buy for life. So, you know, if you do wear it, you don't like the way it feels, probably no loss. You could sell it. But at the same time, I think this is the kind of watch that could be like your one and only. So if you do like it, it's a keeper and it's an heirloom. A 50 Fathoms is the kind of watch you hand down to your kids and your grandkids. Whereas, you know, an Omega Seamaster, maybe. Maybe. Okay, uh, what do you think about... That JLC duo met. I'll let you have this one. This this I, was going to be take mine. This from but... you. I can't take this from you. I want to hear you talk about it more than anything. What I'll say is 
I love the platinum salmon combination. I love all of the updates. I love all of the upgrades. Now, please go. Yeah. Okay. This is a watch I owned. The Duomet Chronograph I owned in white gold, the limited edition with the black dial. It was my dream watch for four years. My grail, I saved up. I bought it. I owned it for four years. I can't really say there was anything I didn't love about the experience. It did everything that was promised. It was the most accurate mechanical timekeeper I've ever owned. There was no loss or gain of time or power reserve for that matter when running the chronograph because it had a separate drive drivetrain and a separate barrel to drive the chrono. So in terms of being beautiful, it was a JLC built like a longa and finished like a longa. And on the case back, you could easily be deceived into thinking it was a longa. Now the watch is back resolving what I thought was maybe the weakest element of the original. They've redesigned the case. They did go with a glass box style ultra cambered sapphire. And while the watch on paper is larger, it's now 42.5 versus 42 for mine. Just looking at the lug profiles, they're shorter, they're cropped, they're downturned 90 degrees from the case band. This is going to be a watch that wears smaller. And the only reservation I've got is that the bridges are now silvered, and I've heard some whispers that this might be rhodium-plated brass, which would disappoint me a little bit since it used to be German silver. But I can also see that most of the decorations and the architecture haven't changed. So even if this is brass, I'm not going to knock it too much because the combination of the engineering of the movement with the finishing of the movement with the power of that salmon dial and platinum combo, this is a watch to remember. I got a chronograph that you folks out in the internet land might like, the Mont Blanc 1858 Minerva chronograph, the Unveiled. Now, this is not the first time they've done an open dial inverted mechanism Minerva chrono, but the combination of the white metal case, the coined bezel, uh, the blue and gold accents on the movement makes this a really compelling uh, limited edition of 100 pieces. It's 43 millimeters in stainless steel, which I like because so you don't have to pray for, you know, some sort of steel model to come out down the line and you don't have to pay a precious metal premium you get the one you want right up front so they come out with steel 43 millimeters uses a minerva caliber those of you who maybe don't follow mont blanc as clearly there are two different factories one is in le Loc, which can make over a hundred thousand watches a year those are your mass-produced watches and then there's minerva which previously was a standalone high horology brand and this is mont blanc minerva and they've actually kept the old minerva name including on some of the watches because it is so special they make a few hundred watches a year there so production is very low it's artisanal it's at that Langa, Patek, uh, Grubel 4C, Romain Gautier level of you know no questions asked best in the business finish and so what you get here is what you want when you buy that kind of a movement but you get all of the chronograph mechanism including the clutch and the column wheel the levers and the horns on the dial side the balance and the escapement are on the dial side and surprisingly it is quite well loomed, which you might not expect on a watch like this. The watch being steel is everyday durable. And here's another example of like a glass box style crystal. A big slow beat rate of 2.5 hertz with an overcoil hairspring column wheel feel for days, mono pusher actuation, and something you don't commonly see, which is a lateral sapphire in the case so you can see through the flanks of the case and you could see how the inverted movement was assembled with pillars like an old marine chronometer so it's got a spectacular three-dimensional profile that looks great as you gaze in through the crystal so this is a watch that looks good from the front from the back and from the side can't say that of too many watches for under fifty thousand, i believe this is well under fifty thousand us this is well priced this is one i missed actually minerva architecture is outrageous i love looking at minerva movements i'm not the biggest mont blanc fan in general but this this leg of mont blanc is is beautiful it's second to none it's gorgeous I also think that with this watch, you have something that leads with its merits and is almost 
too discreet about where it comes from. Like, I think a lot of people are skeptical about Mont Blanc watches because they say, oh, they're pens, they're accessories, maybe leather goods. No, no, they're very much watches. And you have to be comfortable with this idea that Minerva is now sort of a tenant brand of Mont Blanc. So you have to be able to get over the idea of a Mont Blanc watch, which a lot of people still struggle with, but then also educate yourself about what Minerva is and what it was. Otherwise, you wouldn't know the difference between a Laloque Mont Blanc and a Minerva Mont Blanc, and frankly, you probably wouldn't realize that you're looking at something that deserves to be compared to the very best chronographs in the world, including the Dottograph, the 1815 chronograph, and also the Albert from Languntina. This is really that good. Uh, this, this is a watch that could be an exit watch. If you're a chronograph collector, this could be the last watch. It's that good. Uh, okay, so now here's another one I really like, guys. Chapek, a little bit like Longa, was taken aback by the enthusiasm for its sports watch. And so just as the last few years of Longa have been more or less dominated by news about Odysseus and Odysseus variants, Chapek has all been about its own Antarctique sports watch line and new variants of it. So I was happy this year when their most intriguing model turned out to be a dress watch, the Chapek Promenade Guto. It is a ripple of water on an enameled dial with time only, three hands, no indices, no date, and it is a grand faux enamel dial that has rippling tones and textures to create the impression that it's actually three-dimensional. And all of this is a trick of the eye achieved with different weights of blue enamel. So this is beautifully poetic. It's compact sized to 38 millimeters. It is stainless steel, which means it is the right material for this kind of application. And it's a limited edition, which I really like, but it's priced at $20,600 with the Antarctique movement. This is the first time the SXH5 micro rotor caliber developed by Daniel Martinez and Emmanuel Boucher. This is the first time it's been featured on one of Chapek's dress watches. It's the first time it's been featured on one of the company's non-sports watches. 100 pieces in this edition. And for me, this is a watch I would take over any of the Antarctique because the dial is artisanal, the case is perfectly sized, and the movement is in no way compromised. The finishing is above any other Chapek movement. The architecture, which is the size, the shape, uh, the relation of the pieces in proportion to each other, the architecture is second to no other Chapek watches. 60 hour power reserve, micro rotor out of platinum, a kaleidoscope of colors, textures, tones, and materials. This to me is the dress watch winner of the whole show. If, if we take complications and sports watches out of the equation, this is up there with the new integrated bracelet, a golden ellipse. This, this is like contender for best dress watch of the show. I am, uh, I, I have mixed feelings about Jepek in general. Um, I don't care for Antarctique much, but I do like this end of their watchmaking a lot. I really love the movement too. It fits the case really nicely. It's an attractive architecture. I'm a sucker for a micro rotor. So this is very well done. Very well done by Jepek. I would anticipate that if there's, if, if watch collectors have any human soul, these 100 will go quickly. Oh, without a doubt. This brand has a very interesting cult following and um, the, the followers of the brand really do like it. I think Antarctique maybe muddied the waters a little bit and that was a watch that a lot of people bought to flip. Um, but Jepek as a brand generally are purchased, is, is a brand purchased by collectors and people who will wear them long term. Zenith, the ultimate watch nerd brand. Okay, so this is not part of Watches and Wonders, but it is a 2024 release. They launched a new version of the long-running Triple Calendar El Primero. So it's a Chronomaster original in 38 millimeters in steel. Three different dials, one in silver, one in green, which is the boutique model, and then one in a sort of a ruthenium with rose gold hands and indices. Now, Traditionally, this would have been an El Primero caliber 410, but these have the newer El Primero 3600, which is the El Primero Generation 2. What's different? Well, the 3600 has 10 hours more power reserve at 60, hacking seconds, which the traditional El Primero did not have, and it also uses a full silicon escapement plus the striking 10th complication that gives you a flying seconds hand that allows you to more easily read one-tenth of a second because it spreads those 
seconds, 10 seconds, over 360 degrees of dial. So it is a super animated watch with the complication running. So you have a triple calendar, a moon phase, the spectacular striking seconds Foudrillon chronograph, all of this in a 38 millimeter case, full bracelet, 13,900, boutique with the strap and the green dial, that's 13,400. This is a great watch. Th this is a watch that's fairly priced. I think there's better value if you get it on the bracelet because 500 bucks more, you get a bracelet. Uh, but I do think that there's something to be said for the rose gold and silver and green and blue tones of that boutique edition dial. Can't go wrong with these. I think it's the successor to the long running triple calendar El Primero. This, this is a bullseye. Yeah. Knockout piece. It's uh, legible. It's the green one is, is really, really cool. Actually. I like that a lot. Okay, um, you, ha you have to make the call. Best in show. Oh, gosh. That's so, so, so difficult. I really, like, my, my knee-jerk reaction to best in show was Cartier because I liked it most. But I, I really have to give it to uh, the house brand, uh, Debatune. I, I think Grand Comp really, really knocked it out of the water. I think it, it represents um, a, a significant benchmark in watchmaking, and I think it... Uh, a significant benchmark for the brand. I love complications, so I'm not going to disagree with you there. Uh, just because I know folks outside are going to be skeptical of any answer that begins and ends with something we sell from an in-house brand. <laughs> um, you guys know how much I've loved Abitun. I've been doing poetic homage videos to Debatoon since 2016. We bought them in 2021. So I'll give you a best in show that is not a house brand. And that is the Promenade Guto from Chapek. This is a beautiful watch. This is what a independent brand limited edition should be. Everything about this watch is right. There's literally nothing about it I would change. Even though I'm usually a skeptic of watches without indices on the dial, this is so beautiful that I could suffer any lack of minute by minute resolution in return for the sheer artistry of every piece, dial, case, and movement. I love it. I think it's a knockout. I think it was uh, best in show for dress watches. All right, guys, if you are out in cyberspace, reach out to us. We are podcasts at the 1916company.com. Tim out, Armand out, 1916 out, and thanks for logging on. <laughs>